Hi, everybody. We have a really wonderful guest today, Lori McDonald, who is very experienced in the field of hypnotherapy with abductees, the abductee experience. And I don't know why things just kind of come in runs. You've noticed lately with Project Blue Book and some other shows, I've done quite a bit on uh, ETs and UFOs and so forth. But this is a really fascinating story because Lori took it the extra mile to find out how this experience is differing from culture to culture. What is the Western experience in abduction versus the Far East. And we're going to get into that because she went there to teach some workshops and has uh, dealt with a lot of experiencers in the East. And we have distinct experiences. So without further ado, let's bring Lori on. Lori, it's good to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Regina. Yeah, you've had a long career in this. And first of all, I mean, everybody would have to say, how does the hypnotherapist get involved in this? And you've been asked that a thousand times, but here's the thousand and one. Um, obviously, there was something very personal in this that drew you into this particular application of hypnotherapy. So tell us a little bit about your own experiences. And, and as I heard in another show, even that of your mother, just to give us a little background. Okay, on the hypnotherapy part first, I um, <clears throat> was going from being a master hypnotist to a clinical hypnotherapist, and I had to regress a subject in front of a panel of four people. Four judges were behind me, and the subject was regressed, and he was actually seeking uh, creativity. He could sense it, but wasn't able to draw it out of himself. So anyway, uh, he spontaneously regressed to the age of 10 where the family was camping and he had seen a UFO. His brother and him began to talk. The UFO landed on a hillside, opened, entities uh, came off the UFO. I asked them at that point if he would describe the entities to me. And all of a sudden, a sphere of light about this big appeared above his head and whipped down to the end of his body and I didn't know what to do. I stopped talking. I looked over my shoulder at the judges and two of them were like wide-eyed, mouth open, and they like indicated for me to continue because after all, I had somebody regressed. So I, I began again to ask him about uh, the occupants of the craft and he came back up to his normal age and was like what craft <laughs> so i carried on with the session and, and at the back of my mind kept saying he said what craft he said what craft right after the light you know but i'm trying to be cool so all of a sudden just like that i got a reputation and that was in about uh, 1993 for dealing with uh, experiencers cool okay. So I have another obvious follow-up question from here. What did the panel of judges think after they saw this? That's, has, that's not your normal test out, you know, for clinical hypnotherapy at all. They were quite shocked, but they were amused as well. They said they expected as much from me, and we carried on. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was an alchemical hypnotherapy institute and we had already studied alchemy and so something like that appearing wasn't that hard for them to process okay so good you were in a supportive environment so let's go to part two which is my understanding is this is an experience you have had it's an experience your mother has had so you were also well equipped to do this because you were well, if not comfortable, very familiar anyway. So let's talk about first your mom's experience and then your experience. Okay. It's a little bit uh, complicated. However, um, I didn't hear about my mother's experience until I turned 50 years old. I had just um, finished uh, working out all the details to do a, a reality TV show called Experiencers with Jim O'Connell. And I had been on another show and I get this phone call and the lady said, hi, Lori, this is your mother. I'm like, what? Um, and she said, um, I saw you on TV and I, I can't believe how many people you help with your experiencer groups. And it really touched me. And I wanted to, to let you know um, the story of your birth 
and why I, I couldn't raise you. And so I said, okay, let me get my husband and the speaker and the tape recorder. <laughs> and I had her hold on for a moment and uh, asked her to just begin wherever she felt comfortable. And she had said that for the nine months that she was pregnant with me, she had experiences. She would sense um, an entity observing her and she would try to block that out of her mind. She would see what she thought were extraterrestrials. And then it began to progress and she became uncomfortable. She talked to her doctor who said, it's probably hormonal, don't worry about it. Um, continued to progress. She, they sent her to a therapist and the therapist told her that at the risk of possibly losing your other kids and sounding totally crazy, you really need to, to shut it down. And so she kept her journal and she stopped talking about it. In fact, she kept that secret for 50 years. And then she said, she was out early in the morning and she was sitting in a lounge chair and just sort of instantly and out of nowhere, two extraterrestrials appeared on either side of her and she went with them because she always went and as they moved through the apple orchard she was aware that her feet were touching the ground and she described this sense of time being slightly distorted she continued to flow through and in the clearing of the apple orchard where the tractor turns for harvest um, above that was a, a UFO and without any thought she just was on the craft she did become aware uh, physically aware that her feet were cold and that it felt possibly like metal so I thought that that was a good indicator uh, she continued to talk about uh, invasive exams she described great detail of the table that she lied, laid on. She, in fact, she said, um, when I would interrupt occasionally for a further description, she said, you know, honey, it's one of those tables shaped like an ironing board. And I was like, I actually don't know about ironing boards. <laughs> but uh, she um, was very detailed. The extraterrestrials, when she would become more aware of what was happening. They would tell her that she was okay, not to be afraid, and that uh, they were really only interested in her baby. And she had always kept that in mind, that the interest was just in her baby. And she had a difficult time later with that. But after their examinations, she awoke on the lawn outside of the house, um, bleeding both vaginally and from the nose and she was in full labor and she was calling for help and the whole house was just in this deep sleep and nobody would wake up but the neighbor who was getting ready to leave for work did hear her he was able to wake the household and they did take her to the hospital where she labored until she gave birth to me she said that i wouldn't feed on milk of hers or any animal and it was very difficult she had a really hard time and i have an imagining that she was suffering some from post-abduction stress disorder and uh, resisted bonding and that was her story <laughs> i mean that's beyond fascinating of course <laughs> it's uh, certainly not your normal birth um, was there some indication at any point along the way or that you've discovered along the way that they were interested in you for a very specific reason and might some of your DNA have been donated by this group of people, beings, or why were they so interested in you? No idea why they'd be interested in all, but I'll tell you this. What they're interested in is the human entity. Mm -hmm. as a whole. And they're interested in the human genome, but I, I'm imagining that they would like to piggyback the right. extension process through a hybridization program, but that's not going to happen. So I think that they're becoming well aware of that. They, many of us know how to shut them down. And so it's just a bit of a push 
of uh, intent with the right use of will and energy. And they do sort of get the idea. I mean, their intentions, although sometimes seemingly nefarious and insidious, are really just self-serving. Right. And misunderstood, but that doesn't negate the fact that the human often is terrorized and put through an enormous amount of stress due to this, uh, the psychological impact and the consciousness effects. I mean, they're forced to, to uh, challenge their reality. You mentioned a moment ago, um, as they were um, abducting your mom during this period of time when you were in gestation, you said that uh, it, she said that was the reason that she didn't have a chance to raise you. Um, what happened after that? You said you didn't bond naturally and because you were rejecting animal milk of all kinds, including human and such. What happened after that? They still hate all milk. Um, <laughs> but uh, she tried uh, the best that she could. And then eventually, um, I think I lived with my grandmother and other relatives, um, even leading to just living with my father and without siblings or just one sibling and then eventually into uh, children's aid into foster care and group homes until I was about um, I'm gonna say 15. Okay well that's a tough go I mean was it was it as difficult as it normally is for people in that circumstance or were you somehow spunky and equipped to deal with it? I think I'm psychologically prepared for an accelerated learning path, uh, regardless of whatever entails. I, I really do believe that um, whatever happens to a person is up to them to gauge the situation, use it to benefit their own self, their consciousness. Don't really take it personally. I mean, that will spiral you out of control. You know, these are just small challenges. And uh, with a properly adjusted attitude, we really can deal with anything. In fact, I don't believe in hopelessness. And I would never underestimate the human spirit. <laughs> there you go. Oh, boy. I couldn't agree more with you. <clears throat> Absolutely. So let's talk about the time when you began having your own experiences and uh, how that played out. Well, again, uh, not exactly typical, but somewhat. Um, when I was about uh, five and six, I, I was aware that um, there were many colors that other people weren't exactly seeing. And um, that I began to associate colors with um, feelings like emotions, just simple ones, because I was just a simple kid. But um, then there was a specific color like this, illuminated violet, like it's the most soft yet bright, plasma-like, but lovely, really, um, color. And it would be in the silhouette of what seemed to be three females, and uh, they were very kind. Um, I know that they always called me by my name and they were respectful. And it's kind of my personal philosophy at this age is I won't deal with any entity that doesn't uh, call me by my first name and respect me. And how, how old, are, what age are you speaking of right now? Six. <laughs> okay. So yeah, six. And um, so then I wandered off by myself at a, at a carnival one night and I um, walked outside of the bright lights and I followed uh, two small beings and we moved into something underground and something very smooth and um, I walked in and I know that I was walking down because I remember the sensation of like a down ramp. And when I walked into the room, they just walked right over to me, like familiar. 
And then another came and was carrying, took a light of some sort off of a pedestal and um, he handed it to me and, and I held it and I knew that that like little orb thing was a, a living thing. I felt the life in it and, um, and then I don't remember. But then later uh, in that year, I saw one night I woke up and I was looking out my bedroom window and I saw two grays walking my brother down the driveway. And I remember thinking that you know, I was born and raised in Canada and he wasn't dressed right. You know, they're always warning us about uh, freezing to death. <laughs> And so uh, I was about to call out to him to tell him, you know, he wasn't dressed right. And the violet ones told me no and to step back. They always spoke very simply and uh, they didn't want me to talk to them. And then later in my 30s, when I did have sort of that very typical gray experience, well, typical except that in my background, like to the left of me, was the same violet entities and they told me two things they said focus and control and i did i focused my energy i controlled my mind i became very lucid and sat up into the presence face to face eye to eye with two small gray aliens and i was as calm as i am in this moment and I was actually anticipating some type of intelligent uh, conversation, exchange of information, certainly something. And I was anticipating that. And they sort of just gently tilted their heads towards each other. And I felt like they spoke over my head, like they were whispering in front of me, but without words. So I, I get it. I know what they were doing. But then in a moment um, that this white light zippered open <laughs> and out walked a taller gray and um, it had like a, a, a needle about the size of a chopstick. And I was pretty cool right up until it became like almost touching my knee. And I saw like this claw part on the hand I was very uncomfortable with that. And when it lifted the needle, I tried to do like a, a reverse round kick and sweep it into the side of the head from a defensive position. And I remember sort of whiting out. Like I didn't black out. because I remember like the last colors, everything was, I whited it like milk. And um, when I came to, I was still in pain from whatever they were doing. And uh, from fighting him, I had tore my abdominal muscle and I went to the hospital and later had surgery and a mesh implant put in and they asked how I, how I did that. And I had to tell them in a nightmare because I wasn't really in a position to... No. Uh, <laughs> so you understand the phenomena through and through. You know, you've had the experience through and through. So... Coming to more current times since 1993, when you began utilizing hypnotherapy after you tested out so well at abductees <laughs> intervention, <laughs> um, tell me about the kind of array. I mean, a lot of people, I think, watching this are probably aware of John Mack's work, uh, Passport to the Cosmos, and so forth, and that he really he said there is a phenomenon. These people have too many similar stories to call it random. They have gone through some kind of phenomena. So let's talk about the nature of the phenomena in general that it is kind of common to the experiencers. And then we'll go on from there. There's a timeline of common experiences. What we see now in 2019 isn't what we saw in 1993 or in 1980 and um, when John was doing his work with Bud and I did talk to them a few times at uh, consulting. And um, so there was a big push in the 80s and the early 90s for the hybridization program. Practically every single person 
described the entities as grays, the small, spindly, large eyes, uh, harvesting genetics, and uh, many women uh, being brought into what was nurseries with different forms of babies, different colored skin, some babies with like um, uh, trunks for noses, like they look like little... Little begin ashes. Uh-huh. Uh, exactly. That's what they said. And uh, it was very interesting. Uh, so we saw a lot of that. Today, when we talk about extraterrestrials, people are talking about uh, reptilians and Pleiadians. The mantis, they show, they've shown up all along, uh, in hybrid form and in full form too, except that they're very big. Um, and so when a mantis, it, you're in the presence of a mantis being, they generally keep about 10 to 12 feet away from you uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, uh, they're very hive-minded, and so they're uncomfortable outside of their element. And we humans have a way of asserting our individuality and at the same time being aware of a collective and the collective consciousness and so forth. We are... Uh, we have a personality and an individuality where many of the extraterrestrials, as far as the abductor races go, because they all tend to be a little bit more hive minded, um, think differently and we have to think differently. That's where part of my work in comparing the experiences in the 80s or the 90s or just experiences that are abduction, that are contact or that are downloads. Some people go willingly, some against their will. And so there are all these categories, and I had to narrow them down to make it clear for myself. And then I really started seeing this a download, you know. But at the same time, you have to be aware that technology is advancing, and uh, psychotronics and scalar energy and zero-point energy and voice-to-skull communications all of these are a result of hearing a voice in your head. And so I began to create a protocol separate of, from the abduction protocol just for people receiving uh, downloaded information or information that they think is coming from an extraterrestrial. I have a, a little questionnaire to ensure that it's not... Yeah. Uh, some other type of entity. Yeah, that was really what I was going to get into next. So um, we can talk about the common themes up until, and then even up and through recently. And then I want to talk about how you determine whether it is something that's more psychotronic versus an actual experience uh, with an ET. Yeah, it's very difficult to tell. I mean, and we have to throw in there... Um, uh, hallucinations, auditory yes. hallucinations, uh, and mental illness. I yes. mean, not everybody who comes to me believes that they've had extraterrestrial contact or was abducted by an alien actually has been. Um, some are mistaken. Some are dreaming legitimately. And some are suffering from drug abuse and they hallucinate and I get them the help that they need. We put them into a treatment center. Let me ask about that because when a person is doing various drugs um, and alcohol that can be really damaging to the aura, there is less of a, an ability to almost fend off also entities from other realms. Is there sometimes just a bleed through happening by other entities disturbing them because of uh, a weakness within their own shield, so to speak, um, and it poses as mental illness? Well, okay, so the effects on the consciousness and of uh, drugs and alcohol, they don't call alcohol spirits for nothing, okay? Exactly. You, you can draw a negative energy, um, an entity that's a discarnate who shared a similar drink or um, whatever the choice might be. And so they'll stick around uh, for that sort of thing. They'll hang around trying to absorb the energy or the sensation of drinking again because they're true addicts in this life and beyond. But um, there's also, you know, 
the voice to skull communication, there's a large number of people who are targeted individuals and they're coming with their own issues. And so I get them, um, they sort of bleed in. But when a person is doing drugs, this is the thing, depending on the type of drug, if it is a one that can actually raise your frequency, then you might be able to just become more open and receptive chemically speaking, to receiving a frequency of either another dimension or an extraterrestrial. Right, right. Drug induced, but it doesn't doesn't make it um, unreal. Right. Just like ayahuasca, if someone were to do that, or a DMT, or the God molecule, they are having a legitimate experience. Now, the idea, though, for those people, might be for them to see that you can use that uh, ayahuasca as a catalyst to kickstart your own ability to, to have that form of communication. And so nobody should be judged or condemned. However, if you're using some type of methamphetamine drug, then, then you're knocking on the devil's door there and um, you will have a very negative psychic attack. Okay, so let's um, let's go back to part one, which is the eras and the phenomena that was common, as you said, in the 80s and 90s, it was mostly seemed to be genetically oriented. Let's move forward closer to today and what those experiences are like. Right, it's not just the um, download of information, and, and really they call them downloads. I prefer to say it's a consciousness hijacking because this is something, again, happening outside of your desire. This ha overtakes your free will, and the information streams into your consciousness, and it's sometimes uh, given, you're given directions, you know, go drive here, go do that, uh, build this organization. And, uh, and people do it because... They're not sure how to question it or, or what to do. Um, many people are still coming from a place of uh, disempowerment and not fully understanding, and um, they're, they're learning. But we've also got a whole bunch of people running around um, and calling themselves uh, starseeds and uh, light workers and Pleiadians, and no offense to any of these lovely people. But it, they're limiting their access and they're opening themselves to probable, probable manipulation because the shape-shifting uh, reptiles can look very much like a Pleiadian. And one of my issues, a big issue that I'm having right now is uh, experiencers having sex with... Um, the aliens, I mean, we're talking men and women of all ages uh, saying that um, it's extraordinarily difficult to resist. And this is very uh, unusual. And um, in fact, it's a violation of the fundamental universal laws for humans and if the human isn't uh, strong enough to step into their personal power and uh, state their uh, belief, then, then um, the extraterrestrials that are doing this will manipulate the situation. And that's what's happening. And so I've been struggling with several clients trying to, and they're struggling themselves, you know, trying to just, say no. I mean, because their senses are overcome. It's another form of, to me, it's like a psyops, like a psychological operation, whether it's extraterrestrial or a military laboratory operation. It's a psychological operation, and I am dealing with the uh, effects of it. You know, we speculate at the cause, but the effects are real. So that's a good question. <clears throat> I've heard one um, experiencer say that they would literally take her to a facility uh, in the middle of the night. 
Um, so that's one. Other people say that they're taken, their bodies are simply taken up. Others seem to feel that it's almost more their consciousness than oh. not their body. So let's talk about the difference between those, especially when we're talking about engaging in sex with, you know, someone from an off-planet culture. <laughs> right. Okay. And so... That's very good. Um, excellent. Yes, there is a consciousness hijacking. There is out of body where the soul or the multidimensional aspect of the self moves with the ETs. And that's a problem. Sorry, that really upsets me because when they are able to manipulate that particular energy, then then we're giving them enormous access to powers that we don't even fully understand, although some of us do realize that they are creator powers, creator energy. And so uh, that's, that's a huge violation, and so certainly something needs to be done. And so it comes back to empowering the person and giving them the appropriate information, like non-compliance, the universal law of that. The extraterrestrials are using loophole information. If the person doesn't declare their sovereignty and say, no, I'm not going to be a part of this, but they go just like my mom did. She said she went, she always went. Then she's non-verbally complying. And based on those laws of compliance, you're giving them permission. Now, I don't believe in soul contracts, and I'm not a soul attorney, and I don't know a lot about that. But I would say uh, beware. Um, anything that you're not fully conscious of, you don't have to comply with. So just like a cop is legally allowed to lie and manipulate a situation to get something from you, apparently so are the extraterrestrials. And so we need to step up our understanding of the self and of the other players here. There's like a good five or seven abductor racers that all would be within from here to the outer band of the Milky Way. I'd say beyond the Virgo cluster is more the celestial entities, a higher frequency being. Um, and those are the ones that people experience great love, uh, unconditional love and acceptance. And they're extraordinarily uh, permissive. When I had my personal experiences, they always asked if I was afraid. Are you afraid? They would say. Do you want to come? Do you want to see? That was always the question. Mm -hmm. Do you want to see? Because they would always show me. And, um, you know, that's a learning thing, it, which is completely different than somebody coming and physically taking your body and harvesting your genes or through other, some other form of technology spontaneously pushing the soul outside of the body and I've had my own out-of-body experiences and so I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am me inside or outside of this body I'm fully aware in fact I had such an issue with always coming out of the body every time I would sit to relax and I was only into meditating in about my 12th year I began to have this out-of-body issues I'm at, year 39 now for as a meditator but at year 12 I kept coming out of my body and I said okay the lesson here is I'm still me outside of the body but it continuously happens so it must be a bigger lesson um, I eventually found through a strangest of all ways a, a Buddhist temple where I, I spent the next five years learning and uh, how to control the mind and body and I'll tell you, those Buddhist monks taught me more about other worlds and extraterrestrials than anything or any experience or the thousand cases that I've dealt with. So there's another layer to all of this that is, touches our spirituality. Indeed. Okay. So, gosh, we could go so many directions with questions right now. Okay. I'm going to choose this one path for a moment, then we'll switch over. So what were some of the things that you were shown? Um, by the beings after they asked your permission and it, assuming you were in agreement say yes you can show me what kind of things were you shown um, how to come out of the body and how far and where I could go which is practically anywhere but I didn't know these were all questions that I had I mean because I'd walk around myself and go wow 
you know, how, where, what should I do though? Where should I go? What can I do? And uh, so anyway, I, they would ask if I wanted to go and I would, I said, yeah. Um, when they asked me if I was afraid, I told them, no, really, I'd been waiting all of my life for this. And they moved me up out of my body and I could feel as I rose the different spheres of density, the atmosphere moving up through the stratosphere. And then eventually, right before I, I was to break into space, there, I, there, I was stopped. There was no, there was no way to go. Um, and then another entity appeared and it evaluated the situation and allowed us to pass something is the best way I can explain it. And then I did burst out into space and I looked down to see where my body was and there was no body. It was just like stars and planets. And uh, I began to get it. And I said to them, what well, I'm still Lori, how can I still be Lori now? And they're like, you're still Lori now. And um, in between my eyes were like light years of information coming in. And um, in the distance, I saw a golden planet. And then I knew then and there about this higher frequency energy. And I think they said the uh, real fifth dimension. I don't know, real, true, something like that. Um, but uh, so as I saw it, I instantly was there. And they were like, following me at this point, like, slow down, slow down. But this golden planet, um, it had three levels of energy, like a lower, middle, and a higher. And the beings all there, some were, like, robed. But I think it was because they shone so brightly that the ones in the lower ones couldn't see them until they did have a robe, and then they created, like, this silhouette. But it was really, really, I was awestruck, and it was beautiful, and I wasn't leaving. And they, when they did tell me that I'd had enough, um, I said, uh, no, I hadn't had enough, and I'll be staying. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it wasn't until they actually spoke the vibration of my daughter's name followed by my son's name that I felt this like gravitational pull mm -hmm. and back right down and they laid me on my bed and I was like wait wait don't, don't go because um, I don't really know what to call you or your name and they were like giddy about it and um, and I said come back because even though I'd seen them and be two words, very short words here and there. I didn't ever have this level of um, experience. And um, well, they told me I passed. And I actually thought they told me I died, which is why I was confused that I was still Lori. Um, because passed, to me, meant passed away. That's what I thought. And, but um, they did come back again three nights later and did show me more. I have a, a, a higher understanding now of, of fourth and fifth dimensional consciousness thinking and the behavioral pattern that's necessary for a person to vibrate naturally into that. So the planet Earth herself, so abundant and beautiful, will look the same in the fourth dimension. Uh, but we'll perceive it differently, just like in the fifth, we'll be seeing it in the higher form because we'll resonate in that particular frequency. And so, yeah, I learned things. Um, uh, that's fascinating. And I've always, um, I've always thought of that because I look at the multidimensionality of us and the planets, our, our host planet Earth and the other planets. And it's wonderful that you had a glimpse to see into the other dimensions of these bodies. And it also explains something about why so often people see beings with robes um, that actually it, maybe their light would blow your eyes out if they're more advanced beings. So I think that's quite uh, fascinating. Oh, yeah. Um, it's really quite amazing. And 
you know, and when I told the monks <laughs> at the temple, they weren't surprised. That's my next question is, what did the monks tell you, show you, or help you understand? Because this is a part of the monks' reality that um, people in, in deeply esoteric circles are aware of, but most people are not. They taught me how to control my mind and my body. In fact, I would do 18-hour meditations with the monks and could shift my consciousness awareness. I see now, possibly for the merging of the higher self with the self, um, just having a more broader consciousness, not just limited to the third dimension, but an awareness like you have here. So I think that adaptability, they teach you um, how to control the mind and body. And that is what all my work is, you know, as a hypnotherapist is controlling the mind and body. So they were very instrumental in, in anchoring the belief of what we can do and what we're supposed to be doing. So they did tell me about other planets um, and parallel universes. Parallel universes are different because uh, they're still in the third dimension. So, so us perhaps having this uh, very same interview at, in a parallel universe, just a couple of frequencies off, um, would have the same sort of uh, expectancy as far as consciousness goes, but outside of the par uh, parallel universe is moving into fourth and fifth, which is actually ascending, going higher. So the trick right now is actually getting people to just timeline jump from, you know, from third dimension to third dimension. Again, it's a trick, it's a manipulation, it's a misuse of your energy. The progression is three, four, five, six. Come on now, right? <laughs> Don't need to be jumping between third dimensional time loops. Um, okay, so um, now let's go to your trip and what you started to, okay, first of all, just to kind of wrap the experiences recently, rather than going in and being in a laboratory setting and being poked with needles and having eggs extracted and all of this, it sounds like people are enjoying natural sex on the other in the, on the other plane with the ETs now in the twenty late 20 teens and going into 2020. Yeah, um, it's out of this world now. Yeah. Okay, so what is the purpose of that? What is, do they have any sense of why they're doing it or what the thinking is on the part of the ETs? What are the ETs trying to get out of this as far as you've been able to determine? I, I mean, I, I do think they're trying to piggyback our ascension I think that all along uh, the abductor races understand the definition of human. So it doesn't matter that seven, 10, 100 different extraterrestrial races visiting the planet, one common denominator, and that is us. All of them interested in us. Yes. Human is just the definition. Doesn't mean people, it's not gender. Those are subcategories, race and gender. Human is light. Hue is what we measure light in. It measures depth and saturation. And man is short for manifestation or to come into the physical to be embodied. So human is a light embodied. And when you understand what you are, you begin to understand what you're capable of and what your mission is. People are running around identifying uh, in different, in all the wrong areas, not moving intrinsically, intuitively, not understanding uh, the true self. And um, so there, that's the problem. I think it's almost deliberate because it strips us of our power and nobody really knows what to think or believe. Very true words. We're uh, 100% on the same page there. And the people that have uh, followed my shows know uh, what a position I'm coming from very similar to yours on this. And maybe since you're, I found out you're not that far down the road from me, we can get together and talk about that sometime. Right. But for now, what I'd like to do is take the conversation to um, Asia. Why did you decide to go to Asia? And what did you find the phenomena to be perceived as there? Hmm. 
Well, it, it did vary. Um, I would be on a remote island um, in the South China Sea and where there would be very limited uh, electricity only for a few hours a day. And I would talk to the village people and what they were were fishermen, okay? Generation after generation of people who fished in the ocean, they had no formal education. They know two things. They know the sky and they know the ocean. And when they're saying to me that they see lights coming up and flying off, um, and they're describing it simply as lights or and flying objects. So their terminology there is actually very similar. Now get back onto the mainland um, and be in Cambodia, Vietnam, or Laos or something like that. A lot of Asia refer to any entity as either the jinn, uh, which can sometimes be associated with either a demon or a hag of some sort. Until, uh, which made it sound more like crypto, you know, stuff. Except that there is a push now in several different UFO groups in China and other countries in Asia where they are receiving straight up um, abduction and face-to-face -face contact like we are here. I was anonymously sent 97 years of UFO activity in China. And then I got it all translated uh, back into English. And then I get this invitation to speak at a peace conference um, on extraterrestrials in Geneva, Switzerland, so to a full Mandarin Chinese audience that's going to provide an interpreter and they want to know about the abduction phenomena. Weird. So then I end up in China again, speaking and teaching some workshops, and they are definitely into it. They're progressing past that gin and looking at it in a more uh, sense of uh, family connections like they are doing here, calling them, you know, this is our, our star family now. So I found that really strange. But, you know, places like South America, other countries, they're still referring to them as cryptos. But mostly in Asia, they think they're demons. So this particular phenomena, <clears throat> is it the same? I mean, have they had the same kind of experiences that we have when they're able to articulate it to you? Uh, yes, the younger people have. It uh, depends. So if I'm in Vietnam, um, I might be talking about experiences that would have happened during the war. And so, and so what was happening then uh, were things coming through portals, uh, what looked like Foo Fighters, orange orbs, and, and so forth, and both sides were seeing that and there were uh, reports in, near the village of Camlo of children being born um, with abnormally large head and eyes and so at first you know they're always saying we have big eyes and so you have to define big you know to make sure that you get what they're trying to say but they would draw and the eyes would be very large animated like and uh, and the mothers wouldn't keep the babies, and many of them were put into orphanages and mm. villages and so forth. Mm. So it's very disturbing uh, that way. Some people refuse to talk about uh, the phenomena at all, and they have mixed uh, spiritual and religious beliefs and don't feel free, you know, to, to talk about that because they're afraid of everything. I found them to be extraordinarily superstitious mm -hmm. so whether it's in Asia or we're back here in the United States or Europe when you're working with clients then what are you able to in the end what are you able to help them with uh, and I know each person is different and as you said to begin with some are having what appear to be a genuine encounter versus others who may have mental illness going on but let's say people have had an encounter what do you usually have to help them through um, five clear steps uh, to personal empowerment from once they've uh, legitimized the experience, then we're moving into some self-acceptance here. Uh, yes, I've had this experience. How does this change me? 
and move right into basically full actualization of fully empowered being, giving them uh, tools, five specific tools on how to maximize uh, the experience using it as a catalyst to expand their own consciousness and informing them of universal laws and explaining too, you know, uh, what some people have used to help them get out of a situation and what's worked for others can inform them that's basic but listening to them uh, regressing them um, and then empowering them it's all about the empowerment aspect because really this is the question where do we go from here you know and so what is our next empowered step so besides the fact that some people aren't or are maybe a little <clears throat> less motivated if they're having hot sex there on the other side. <laughs> um, that notwithstanding, um, where do you see this phenomena going? Because you said earlier um, the hybridization program is not going to happen, where I think many people think it already has happened. So what did you It has. <laughs> it has. But from this point on, uh, many people are learning how to stop it and become, and I teach them how to become conscious. So I think that the extraterrestrials have devices that um, manipulate our either delta brainwave to put people to sleep, or they can simulate uh, the theta in the delta brainwave to recreate the dream state, which makes us compliant. I teach a person how to uh, become aware of the self in multiple aspects or multiple layers of consciousness, whether we're talking specific brain waves, you know, alpha, beta, whatever, or if we're talking subconscious, conscious, lucid mind, full cognitive awareness. So you've had glimpses, I assume, into the future yourself. Yeah. In terms of the nature of humanity and where we're headed. So um, perhaps share a little bit of that with us. Yeah, my. I have had glimpses and um, my take might not be the same as everybody else's. Um, but uh, I don't expect us to get help from anyone. I think that uh, we all help ourselves. I don't uh, need any other extraterrestrial to tell me we have a pollution problem. We're aware of that. I don't need old reiterated information. That's all useless. Tell me how that changes things on the planet. It doesn't. It doesn't change anything. What I do see happening is people understanding the multidimensional aspect of themselves, stepping into their personal power and getting to a place consciously through love and the right use of will into full acceptance of self and others. And when this happens, Nobody feels inferior. Nobody feels superior. There's absolutely no reason for war. You can, in a confident, at ease place in the mind and body, allow somebody else to be themselves without feeling offended or having to trump them in some way. And so we will learn how to do this. We'll learn how to control our emotional baggage, let go of what's doesn't serve us, we will understand that uh, it's up to us and only us, and I'll give you a spoiler alert, we win. I agree with you. So now what is that going to do to the whole ET phenomena and visitations here on Earth if we're being unconsciously piggybacked on right now as we go through our own process of evolution? What happens when we do start in more mass numbers, beginning to really wake up to who we truly are and can't be exploited and taken advantage of in those ways anymore? Then what happens to those relationships? Well, those ETs can go home and figure out why there's such a thin photocopy of their true authentic self. And if they need empowerment, there'll be multiple places here on our planet where we can rehabilitate them. I know that's a little sarcastic. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know, I can't help it. Uh, because I do sometimes, um, it does anger me at their audacity, you know, uh, to violate human rights. It's really 
just outrageous to me. But I do see that when we do become more empowered in the place, our earth becomes peaceful, we'll naturally figure things out, like how to create desalinization plants to grow crops in Africa, how to create windshields to protect those crops from wind and sun. We'll do exactly what it takes to take care of the people. Now, there's nothing to be afraid of when everybody is allowed to be themselves. Doesn't it? Nobody has to be the same, and you can be okay with that. When that does happen, you know, a person's sense of community, confidence, these things begin to grow. We'll elect the leaders, and then we'll make sure that they follow through with what the people want. The extraterrestrials that aren't, or that are self serving, will have to leave, leaving the doors open to the ones that resonate. Tata higher frequency that can create an open conversation to guidance, understanding our place on the planet in, in the universe. Because there is only one thing for sure. The only constant in the entire universe is that nothing stays the same. Everything changes. Everything is in flux. We are moving forward, progressing. In this moment, we're evolving. Indeed. And I, I think it has to irk you more than most people because you're dealing with it directly. When you see the effects of these kind of, I think we can call them otherworldly disinformation campaigns and also even psychotronic um, attacks and such that are convincing people that it's the aliens who are going to save us. I'm with you. I don't see that happening. I, do, I think it's up to us and we have the capability ourselves. And to, to say that, you know, to feel that they're ambassadors from these other planes, for example, and then somehow gain some kind of egoic structure and a following from other people who are still looking to be saved, except now by an earth person who is saying that they're a star seed or whatnot. It's very, been very disempowering in my opinion. Absolutely. It's totally disempowering. Um, you know, when the, an extraterrestrial uh, will have a, we get a relationship with a child and tell them we're your real parents. Right. I mean, what? Right. I mean, breaking down, you know, the family, creating trust and uh, confusion. This is what they do. They try to keep everybody confused. They come like a thief in the night, a thief in the night. They're not, you know, by invitation knocking on the door. The ones that do, are, that are respectful, are worth communicating with. Those will be the ones who will be coming to the planet when things shift, when Earth moves into the fourth dimension. And we're at the top of the third dimension. It won't be long. But yep. what we'll learn is we'll learn, like I've learned, how to practice equanimity, how to be calm and strong among chaos, how to control your emotional energy and your mind and your body. Even when that means saying no to, you know, interstellar sex. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, all the movies are supporting it. I mean, my God, look at all the hot ETs out there right now, or hybrids, or even ex machina. I mean, it's certainly building a desire in people to have sex with a more controlled outcome, shall we say. <laughs> I well, guess you can't blame people for that. You can't. I mean, the extraterrestrials saw how well you could control people with sex here, so they're probably just <laughs> throwing their hand in and giving it a shot. <laughs> oh, well, okay. <laughs> so I, I'm, what I uh, would like to find out finally here before we wrap up is um, people know that they can reach out to you if they've had some of these experiences and you'll help mm -hmm. them work through it. But what about people who are just looking to really merge and connect with their true self, their higher self? Well, I do empowerment sessions. I do empowerment workshops. Um, teaching. I do goddess retreats as well. I'll take uh, seven of the most powerful goddesses on the planet and know that their energy has been imbued upon the psyche of women for thousands of years. And we can draw on that energy and heal ourselves. And when we heal ourselves, the world around us heals. 
And so through the goddess workshops and in, or retreats and uh, empowerment workshops and one-on-one -on -one sessions, you can uh, reach me at True Hypnotherapy, but also a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week free online support group at opusnetwork.org. And Opus is a plethora of doctors, lawyers, surgeons. You have a, we're there for you, whatever you need. Wonderful. Well, <clears throat> you're a woman after my own heart. I love your message. I mean, this is about self-empowerment. It's about not being a victim. And it's about having faith in the incredible strength of the human spirit. I'm totally with you on all that. And I'm so glad we were connected here. So I look forward to meeting you in the flesh one day and having a, an even more extended conversation than what we can have in this short amount of time. So Lori, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Again, you can reach Laurie through trueyouhypnotherapy.com and also the other site she talked about just a moment ago. Until next time, thank you for joining us here on reginameredith.com. Thank you for watching this video. You can find many more like it free of charge by going to reginameredith.com. And if you're finding that this kind of content is adding value to your life, you might want to support my work by clicking on the Patreon button on the website, reginameredith.com. As a patron, you have special videos, insider commentary, and much more. Check it out.